Welcome, everybody, to episode two of World Championship Wreckage. Uh, this is going to be a fun episode. We won't be reading the Old Testament, as Will said last week. Uh, but join with me, as always. I have got my buddy from Bot Spots and Chair Shot podcast over at Rivet City Radio, which we are live simulcast on Rivet City Radio YouTube, Rivet City Radio over on Twitch, and also... Tonight, with a soft opening over on Kick, so uh, that's another place other than the Geeks and Noobs Network here and the Geeks and Noobs Facebook page that you can find us and everything within TGN. But besides all that, we've also got the reddest beard in all of TGN. Yeah, <laughs> the Ginger Ninja Jaxbo, who's got some special words for you, Yo, Jax. Woo. What you got to share with us today? Well, we actually have a sponsor today. In honor of this, I'll raise the roof in honor of this, you know, what we're covering tonight. So let's raise the roof a little bit. The Star Star Trek Fleet Command mobile game. It's it's an MMO. I mean, it's not like you ever play mobile games. I'm going to freestyle mine real quick. You ever play mobile games? You get all them pop-up ads and stuff. None mm-hmm. of that. This one's not asking you to buy anything. This this the Star Trek Fleet Command is not asking you to to shell out any money. It's asking you to have fun. And by downloading a game using the link that we will put in the chat, exclamation point star. Let me do that real quick. Never mind. Beard got it for me. Reach level five. Unlock your second ship and reach level ten before. Sunday really helps out the channel. That again is Star Trek Fleet Command. I mean, at first I was reluctant, but I'm hooked to it now. <laughs> I mean, I'm just trying to press the buttons. It doesn't. It doesn't ask me to sign up for anything or ask me to shell out my own money. So when we see Jax's so, head just going down like that, we're not putting him to sleep. He's playing. He's playing his mobile game. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but welcome everybody that's in the chat. Bree, I saw D, Coach Ron, Jason. So everybody that's in the chat, we welcome you. Tonight is going to be a fun night. Before we get started, I am going to preface this. If you've seen what we're advertising for tonight, we are covering the best of seven uh, for the number one contendership for the WCW World Television Championship back in 1998 between a very young Booker T and a very young Chris Benoit. When you say that name, Chris Benoit, there's a lot of are they really going to talk about that type of reaction? This place, this podcast, this network, it is not a place to talk about that. We are going to be talking about the best of seven series only. If anyone comes into this chat and starts doing that, they will be escorted out the door. We are talking about the wonderful seven, technically eight matches in this series that literally... I would, I mean, I'm not a professional wrestler. I've never, you know, I've never been in the ring, but I feel like if I was going to have somebody that I've never, that I've never, who's never seen pro wrestling before watch it, I, I might show them several of these matches because they're that good. Um, but this is not a place for what happens later on in terms of Christmas Ball. We're looking at these matches right here a lot. So, first off, I want to throw it to both of you guys. What is your first thought when you guys, when I throw out the words World Television Championship? What do you guys think of with that? I think that I had that belt when I got it for Christmas one year and didn't keep hold of it. Now it's lost in the black hole of wherever. It ended the 98 one? Life. Yeah, the three, the, the five. The, gold, the, the solid gold. Yeah, I had, I had a replica one when I was growing up. I should have kept hold of it. Neep, what's going on, buddy? Neep, what up, buddy? Neep. What about you, Will? When uh, World Television Championship, when I say that, what comes to mind? Um, when I think of the the TV title, it always goes back to like in that mid to late '90s push of WDCW with your Dean Malenko's, uh, your Eddie Guerrero sort of like depending on how far into the the process you go. It always seems like that in a lot of ways was kind of the IC title of WCW, like the next in line, so to speak. 
Mm -hmm. um, and that's the way I viewed it. Like the guys who were winning the TV title, you felt like in the next year or two, were going to be in the main event towards Starcade or getting ready for that push. Yeah. Um, so I always kind of saw their TV title as the next in line. Um, it was kind of a toss up between that and the U.S. title. And it really was a TV title. They were on yeah. Nitro, Thunder, Thunder. Saturday Andy. night, pay-per-views. It was a television title and done you so, so well. Um, well, let's talk first about this is a number one contendership best of seven. So let's talk about the champion first that will have to defend his title against one of these two. And it's Fit Finley. Fit Finley in WCW. I remember, like, this time period is, like, the first time. Like, yes, he was in WCW earlier as, like, the Belfast brawler or something like that. But, like, him here with the television title, like, I remember that being, like, the first big, like, exposure to me to Fit Finley. And I remember as a kid just being like, that dude just literally rip your head off. Like, he literally looked like he, he walked out of a bar. He's, and he, he just puts you on your ass in a second. Um, and the fact that he he's not the Undertaker, but he's using the Tombstone Pile Driver as a finish. I mean, come on, um, Jax. What about what do you think of when in terms of Fit Finley? Technician brawler. The I see the the UK style being over here a lot sooner than mm -hmm. what people think. And I know. I, also I mean, like, we watched that match. I don't remember from what, but with the Wrecking Crew, where it was him and Regal, right? I remember we were yeah, like, That's him and Regal. We that, watched. Well, that was match of the night. Whatever. That was like an uncensored from like early nineties. Yeah. Yeah. But I did like how Finley would come out to the ring, like come out to the the top of the ramp, mm -hmm. and watch their matches. Yeah, I've got that in my notes. Yeah. Like he 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 was serious, but he was also talking a ton of shit. He played a he played a very vital role through the entire series. He like he was yeah. always kind of there, mm -hmm. and the importance of putting a best of seven on the number one contendership, like that says what this meant, where they were what the kind of value they were trying to put on this title for that reason was because they said, okay, for you to be the number one contender to have a shot against Finlay, you have to win a best of seven. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of it was it made the title seem it was worth a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, but Jack's absolutely right. Technical madman. He brought British strong style over before it was getting over in a lot of ways. Your Trent Sevens, your Mustache Mountains, all of these guys, you know, that coming from the British Isles, so to speak, in Ireland, Wales, England, like it all dates back to, you know, this guy in Regal pretty much, you know, like mm -hmm. for that and the British Bulldog, um, all of these mid 90s, late 90s guys that came over in England around the same time. Mm -hmm. And like and he definitely I mean. What I loved about with the best of seven is if you if you go back and you're watching these and you're looking at the nitros, the thunders, the Saturday nights, those episodes that they're doing the best of seven, he is defending that title just like we said because it's the TV title. He's on those, so it's not like he's just like oh, I'm sitting back for several weeks. You know, I get a free ride until I figure out who I got to defend this title. Like he's defending and everything, and I mean it's it, it's cool because you can kind of get to, even if you haven't. You know, you're not that familiar with what's going on storyline. You can watch the best seven, watch the Finley matches going on, and you you've got the world kind of going on right there. Um, so to give a little, a little, just a little history of kind of like how we got here, what's going on? You have to go back to the Thunder before the first match of the best seven. So it's going to be May 21st, 1998. Tony Schiavone, and I always love this with WCW, the WCW Championship Committee. Uh, has named Booker T the number one contender for the world television title against Fit Finley. But Chris Benoit comes out, you know, lays out his claim that, you know, he should be the number one contender, and then knocks Booker T out from behind when Booker T doesn't even see it. Um, I mean... It, it, I mean, it's that classic, you know, it's, it's, it's owed to me. No, it's owed to you. Um, and then we get a returning Stevie Ray, who uh, Jackson and I, I don't have had the opportunity to sit down and, and interview, who is a lovely, scary man. I will say that to the rest of the, the ends of that. That man is scary through a camera. <laughs> yes. Yes, he is. Uh, uh, he is straight up just lovely, sits back and is like, let me tell but, you something. Yeah, like I'm like, he's going to come through this like, camera and, and, and I'm like, kill dude. <laughs> But um, but we get a returning Stevie Ray who pretty much is saying, like, you're a champion. Like, how could you get 
jump like this. Like, look where you come from. You, I mean, he's even, you know, he's throwing out the streets in Harlem and everything. You come from blah, 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 blah in Harlem. Uh, like, you got to take this sucker out. All the, all the stuff, you know, uh, that you're used to with Stevie Ray and Booker T. Um, what do you guys think about this kind of being the setup for what will become the best of seven? I think that it starts off the, this is kind of the, the catalyst that helped push both of these guys into that, not necessarily the main event scene, but this was definitely their, their coming of age in WCW. Booker T was still really young. Um, Chris had just made the jump over coming from your ECW types, like just a few years into to working with WCW. So I feel like this was their first big program or big feud mm -hmm. that really helped push them in Booker for one as a singles competitor, having the successes with the Harlem heat. And then you look at Chris and the four horsemen being in a stable as definitive as that has been going through the territories in JCP, like we talked about last week. So this was the first time that you really saw both these men as singles competitors in a lot of ways. Yeah, it. I mean, with Benoit and the Horsemen, it was always like he, he was always just that silent one. Like he's gonna go in there, he's gonna do his job, he's gonna kick some ass, but like he was just always that quiet one. This was the first time where I think that I mean, he didn't speak much, but okay, I've got something to say now, and I'm gonna stake my claim in this that I am the number one contender, um, and that I'm hungry and that I want that belt. Um, what about you, Jax? What did you think about the setup to kind of get us to the best of seven? I like the best of seven. The setup was nice, but it should have always went straight to Booker T. That's what the committee wanted. I hate that damn committee. But the committee <laughs> wanted Booker T, and someone wanted to get their nose up in the business. It put his own nose where it shouldn't be. It's a Booker T said, listen, sucker, <laughs> do it, sucker, you dig it. Well, we go then to the Monday Nitro the following week, May 25th, 98, coming to you from Evansville, Indiana, um, which just makes, when they said that, I laughed because I used to work for Shoe Carnival and that's where it's based out of. Um, so <laughs> on that, on that Nitro, it was announced that there will be a best of seven series for the number one contendership. Um, and we get match match number one. Um, the first thing I want to point out, though, is because I haven't watched a Booker T match in WCW in quite some time. The smaller WCW ring makes Booker T look massive. I said that last night on, on the SmackDown watch along. I was like, yeah. is it just me or does the I think I said it afterwards. Like, is it just me or does it look like the rings? And it was explained to me, no, the rings were purposely done that way to make the stars look bigger yeah it is slightly smaller in wcw but i mean it just makes booker t look huge huge it also yeah. makes the luchadors look a lot faster because they don't have as many steps between times when they hit the ropes it makes everything when you run a shorter ring a 16 or an 18 foot ring versus a 20 foot ring like you can drastically tell the difference when you see the speed and timing on guys running in these smaller rings yeah, and slightly off topic. I mean, you definitely saw it when you throw people in there like Kevin Nash and the Giant and things like that. Like literally, they take two steps and they're from rope to rope. Yeah, like, it's just like there's nothing like the movements. I mean, I mean, it also kind of helped that, especially as they were getting up in age. Like Kevin Nash didn't have to blow out his knee after, you know, if he didn't take three steps and blow it out. It was only two, so it saved his knees probably a couple of times. So as we go into that first match and everything, it starts off very aggressive. You get Booker T. I will say this. I, looking at Booker T here and thinking about WWE, I miss this look of Booker. I like the long trunks and the, and the Harlem Heat. I know in WWE, like, that was not, I mean, yeah, they might have referenced Harlem Heat here and there. But, I mean, WWE, he was that single star. But, like, I still, no pun intended, dug this look the flames and the long trunks and the killer boots and everything still got the like the the tape over the nose and everything like i don't know he looks like he is a legitimate threat to come in and dominate this was all an homage back to the old days yeah. this is like i, I yeah. say that but that's because they just came up you know what i mean they were still young mm -hmm. like they were still running the same gear like that's what i like about it is he this was still fresh and hungry booker t yeah, 
This wasn't the five time, five time, five time, you know, King Booker, Booker T. This guy was still hungry. This guy was still wanting gold, still fighting for it every single day. And I, that's what I appreciated most about the series from both the guys, both the competitors, was that you could tell how hungry they were for what they were doing. It still meant something to them. Yeah. They were trying to find that that place because you had the had the top tier, the Hogan's, the NWO, the Sting, the Wolfpack. You had the craziness and the popular of the luchadors and the cruiserweights. Where are they in this balance? And they were going into like, here's where we are, and we're mm-hmm. just as dominant as both of those levels. Um, it's a, I mean, it's a great, it's a great first match to me. I think the first match, other the first and the last match, I think are my my two favorites of the two. But I mean, it's it starts off with, a, with an aggressive Booker T. There's transitions through the through through each each of the competitors you get the the slow technical side of Benoit um Jack's looking at that first match like what do you take away from from match number 1 I felt match number 1 was a feeling out process for both of them I think Booker T did real good feeling out his opponent mm-hmm. and getting that that feel of them. I was very shocked that the first match ended in a tap out. And a quick out of nowhere tap out. Yeah. I was like, well, the okay. shortest matches. I was like, so these matches aren't going to be necessarily real. I mean, on TV, the television title had a 10 minute time limit match. That was one of the, the rules. Yeah. Pretty much every, pre- looking at the time across the board, pretty much all of them are like, 11 minutes and some change. So yeah, they, for, for the best of seven series, they didn't have that restriction of 10 yeah, minutes. Yeah. But I think the first match was a great feeling out. The ending was shocking to me. Like, yeah, I mean, I went back and the only thing that sucked about going back is watching them through Peacock. You had to go back and forth. Back you and did. Forth. Yeah. That, that yeah. bugged me, but I got down through them all. And it's actually the best of eight. <laughs> yeah, it really is. That's a, that's a <laughs> we'll get there. We will get there. We will get there and why it's the best of eight. Uh, will, uh, f- first match, I mean, they really play up throughout the series that almost like the RKO with Randy Orton, the, the, the cross face can be hit out of, in, out of nowhere, which is not the case as it was later on in his career because you would see him attempting it multiple times and people fighting it off. Here now it is – out of nowhere, he's got the cross face on you. I think everything about this first match was the fight for Benoit to prove he deserved the the number one spot. And somehow they took a Booker T who was, you know, the committee had said, you're our boy. You're going to be the guy. We're going to strap a, a rocket to you, you know? And then Chris is like, nope, I want to come in here. This is my chance. So it somehow – worked its way into where Booker T almost felt like the underdog. And I feel like the tap out at the beginning or at the end of this first match set the pace for it because you could feel that you were like, okay, Booker T has the the charisma and the work, but does he have what it takes, you know, to get four out of seven against somebody that's as dominant as Chris is. What's up, Tommy? What up, Tommy? Tommy, I sent uh, Jack something. He's going to send you. Hmm. We've been in bed all day. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's it, – it, the funny the, – I'm going to point this out probably – I'll probably say it multiple times throughout this entire this entire episode is one thing about WCW's commentary that always bugged the shit out of me. It was not as bad as you got later on into the series, but especially the first few. They're not talking about the match hardly at all. They're talking about everything else kind of going on. Like every once in a while, like, they'll make it. They'll make like reference to the match, or like, of course, Bobby the Brain Heenan, love him to death, but it's got to make a joke. Like, yeah, he can't count to seven, so he can't figure out how who's how long this, how many matches this this whole series will go. So, but yeah, that just annoyed the hell out of me. Is the commentary? Heenan shitted on Booker T through this whole series. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like shitted on Booker T. He really did. It was the other two that were like, it was like, well, I mean, a couple of different shows had different commentators, but like Tanae on the main shows, Tanae and Shivani, I mean, they were the ones like, I mean, they, I will say this, Shivani does a great job of towing that line. Like he was given 
his flowers to Booker T, give flowers to Ben Wallet. Like, they're a threat. They get they like but yeah, Heenan just Heenan Heenan was like complete pro Benoit the entire series. Like what one of the things I loved about Heenan on the booth was that a lot of times he kept a kayfabe approach to he didn't want to know the predetermined winners. So the reaction you saw on screen a lot of times was a live reaction to the match mm-hmm. because he wouldn't want to know the winners. He would call the matches as they happened live. So yeah. that way he could have a real life reaction to it. And I love that about it. And when you rewatch some of this and you go back, you can kind of see that because he pops like a fan sometimes. He and does. I love that about Heenan in the booth. Other than the, what side is he on? <laughs> What side is he on? Uh, but Jax brought it up too, and we get this in the first episode, or first episode, the first uh, match of the series. Comes not down the entire ramp, just at the entrance. We get champion Finley, who comes in and is watching it, and they pan to him. Gold Makes draped, presence really yeah, draped over his shoulder. Um, that gorgeous belt. I love that TV title, that version of the TV title. Um and then at the end, when Benoit wins, I mean, he's given him the, the acknowledgement of "All right, Benoit." Like he said, he's like, "All right, bring it." Like, uh, which was nice to see. It's it's nice, like, even though it wasn't on a mic, like I'm gonna have whoever wins this, blah 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 blah. We got that nice correspondence, that audio from him to make sure the audience knows that he is a presence in this. All right, so after match number one, we move to Thunder. And what I'm going to say about this era of Thunder, I love this damn set. I always did. I loved it. It was the darkness of it and keeping the audience dark and the, the weird, like, slightly angled entrance and you saw them and they had to turn. Like I don't know what it is about Thunder, um, but I'm sure we'll talk about Thunder more in different times, but, like, what are you, did you guys start watching Thunder from the get go? I watched. I remember it being. It was kind of that. Oh yeah, Thunder's on. Yeah, because when it first came out, it was on Thursdays. Yeah, and like it was a really odd night for wrestling on Thursdays because up until that point, it was all Monday. Nice CW was on Friday, and then Sunday night heat. So when they entered, when Thunder started on Thursdays, Thursday seemed like an odd night for wrestling when it was thrown in there. So it was one of those I always watched it when it was on. Mm-hmm. Like if I happened to remember, oh yeah, Thunder's on right now. I watched more Thunder than I did Nitro because growing up we didn't have like the big cable, we had the mm-hmm. basic. So it was easier for me to get like SmackDown and Thunder, yeah, than it was for me to get Raw and. I and I mean later, I, I go ahead, Will. And later in the brand split, well, I'm sure we'll get to this. And when I say the brand split, when I'm, I'm talking the WCW NWO thing, and yeah. uh, you know they were putting a lot of the WCW wrestlers on Thunder, and NWO was running Nitro for the better part of like 16 months. So at one point, that was kind of their homage to pro wrestling was by putting all of those really technical guys on thunder on that Thursday show. And that's what they were kind of, you know, Monday nights was for the theatrics and Thursday was for the wrestling. Yeah. Oh, seriously. I mean, you look at the, the people that were on thunder predominantly. I mean, it's where you're getting the best matches. Like you're getting the Benoit's, the Booker T's, the Finley's, the Jericho's, the Mysterio's. I mean, yeah, you'd get those, you'd get the cruiserweights on Raw, on, 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 I'm sorry, you're so conditioned now after years of WCW being gone to say just Raw, but, um, but on Nitro, um, I mean, look how young, I mean, both of them, I, I, I like watched the entire series, I was like, damn, they're so freaking young. Um, but yeah, so we're in, we're at Thunder, uh, this time we're coming from uh, near Will, Nashville, Tennessee, uh, May 28th, 1998. Um, second match, I mean, it's around the same thing. Like I said, 11 minutes and 28 seconds. Um, we get a little bit a little bit of a different match with this one. Benoit starts a little bit more aggressive, a little more dominant um, compared to that first match. Um, this match, I will say the commentators at least were – this is the match probably the most where they are talking up Fit Finley and how big of a threat Fit Finley is for whoever wins this series. Um, 
it's got a really cool spot where we get it. I mean, they weren't even calling it's got it a the spinner really ring. cool spot yes. where uh, they were like Shivani at one point called it the break, you know, that break dance spin up and like the, the, the leg twirl. But he comes out of that and <laughs> goes for his Harlem sidekick, complete misses and just, you know, gets tied up in the ropes, which is a great kind of missed moment. Um, and then we get, I mean, this is, you joke about the, you know, the hulking up and the comeback. A lot of these matches didn't have like a comeback. It was a very quick, almost yeah. surprise ending. This one had that, all right, Booker T's working from behind. He rallies back and he gets that big win. Um, yeah, that's it, what shocked me right there. The missile drop kick. He hit that and I was like, fuck, you got the win? You for, you forget because he didn't do it as much in WWE. How aerial Booker T was the Harlem Hangover, the missile drop. The missile drop kick was his primary finish. Like the axe kick was the setup. Yeah, his you don't. But it also goes back to the whole when he starts gaining weight and he starts moving into the the heavyweight division. He yeah. starts changing his style, like. Once again, this goes back to the young, you know, uh, Booker T. It's like AJ Styles. He eventually stopped doing springboard 450s. You know what I mean? Like now it's just a special move. And that's the way the Harlem hangover eventually became. It wasn't something he was doing regularly anymore. It yeah. slowly aged out because he wasn't coming off the top rope. He wasn't doing those high risk offensive moves. But with the, like we talked about the size of the ring and being smaller and making. Booker T looks so big when he hits that missile drop kick. He looks literally like he's half. I mean, he he looks like a freaking missile. He gets height. He's extended with his body, and it looks devastating for being a freaking drop kick. Jax, what about you, man? We're second second match, a little bit more aggressive. Booker T working from behind. Yeah, this. you see the second match where you really start seeing the aggressiveness of Booker T coming out. That more hurry up do it kind of like stop showboating around mm -hmm. i think i think it's match maybe it's match five four or five where stevie ray you can see him in the side and he's mm -hmm. just like what are you doing you stop that showboat and shit and get a win yeah and yeah. you can progressively see him stopping the showboating shit and getting Predominantly the wins. What's kind of weird about this is, and I don't know if it Will was looks a, so weird without glasses. I don't. I think every time I look at it, I think the same thing. I'm just gonna say, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna, sorry. I'm sorry. Um, it it's weird though, and I, we'll get there as we get um, Manix. I didn't see you come in. And by the way, everybody, Manix, what's up? Manix, me. along with Jax on Sundays. Uh, history of honor, here. history of honor, where they cover week to week, starting from the very beginning of ring of honor here on TGN. Make sure you, I am super stoked about this series and everything just because I know there's a lot. I don't know. Tomorrow, about ring of honor. Tomorrow's the first, the first watch along starts tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, but and thank you everybody for the chat. Please throw out your thoughts and your remembrance of this best of seven. Uh, or just the youngness of these two competitors. Um, it's a great series. If you haven't watched it, like, send me a message. I will give you. I have the dates. I will give you the exact dates, <laughs> episodes, what what they're on. There's you have to get a link for what we're going into the third episode. But um, yeah, the third match, the only one that is on WCW Saturday Night, uh, and it's May thirtieth, nineteen ninety eight, from Portland, Maine. Uh, and it's not even on Peacock. You had to go find it on, yeah, find it YouTube. on YouTube, and it's grainy and everything. But it is super short. That match, like I blinked and it was over. Like, yeah. like it makes me wonder if this was like pre-taped, and they're like, mm, we can use this one as a seven, and there's do commentary over it. Like that's what it felt like. Um. It's weird because in this one we start seeing a little bit more of a technical side to Booker T. Like it's it, like trying to like do what Benoit does and do some technical moves. Um, what I loved and I think my favorite part of this entire match was the finish. It's a non-finishing move finish. He won with a freaking German suplex. 
Yeah. Actually, that's that's a finishing move. Well, I mean, he would do the rolling suplexes and everything, but like, yeah. I, I the thing I love about the series, I think the most is because, yeah, you get a crippler crossface here, you get a, a missile drop kick and everything, but like, you get wins with non finishes, and I miss those days. Yeah, I, I agree with what Lord Manic says. They were able to increase the intensity and speed each match. Mm-hmm. And each get- match and progressed and progressed and progressed. And they got more and more pissed off at each other too. Like you could tell, like, like they were at the end. They were like, "I'm gonna punch your teeth in." I'll punch, but yeah, that Saturday night episode. I mean, that that whole match. Like, I was watching it while I was like washing bottles, and folding laundry, and like just like because I was I had the time and I was I was like I had the house to myself, so I was trying to get stuff done, but I was trying to watch the same thing. So I had it on the TV through YouTube. And like literally, like I'm watching bottles and I'm watching and everything, and then I'm like, it's it's over. So like, like I had to rewind it, watch the that one again while I was folding laundry, just because I'm like, why did was that so quick? Like, and it's weird. It's weird that it's the only one. I, I guess just to kind of fit it in before the Great American Bash, but um, it it's just it's just so it's just so quick. All right, so let me get into here. So next thing we move on, we're going to match number four. We're going back to Nitro, June 1st, 98 from Washington, D.C. I have a question for you guys before we go into this match and everything. Do you think a lot of people forget about this feud and it kind of gets lost in the shuffle because kind of what's going on around it with the, like the bigger names? This is the whole, This is the whole storyline time of... NWO Hollywood, NWO Wolfpack, trying to get Sting to be one of them, and we get Sting making a decision on the Nitro of one of these matches. I think it's the one I'm on right now, the June 1st, because my note's right above it. But like, do you think that's why people kind of forget about the best of seven? Because it was lost in the shuffle of this big storyline with Sting, who is going to talk for the first time and like make a decision and... I don't think there was a lot of spotlight on the television division at the time. Right, there wasn't the main event for one, one hour. Hour one of Nitro. Right. Yeah, they, they did have. I mean, they put it up there, but I just don't think the spotlight was direct, like enough on them as it needed to be. Yeah. I mean, if you purposely go back and watch it like we did. Then you understand it, but I think watching it back then, you were probably so worried about what was going to happen to Sting, what was going to go on with that. But I do have to take a segue real quick and tell you about our sponsor, yeah. Star Trek Fleet Command. You can download the game by using our link that is in the chat. Um, real fun game. It's an MMO, I believe. There's no, they're not going to ask you to buy anything. There's no real big commercials or anything. Reach level five, unlock your second ship, and if you can, reach level 10 before Sunday at 9 Eastern Standard Time. We'll help support the channel. Guys, like I said, I don't really play mobile games, but I've gotten into this one. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I need to go actually download it. I've been meaning to all week. Just cause you got to grind, some- sir. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm up a lot in the middle of the night, so, I mean, I can... I could do something other than just, you know, search for something to watch. Because in the middle of the night, you're so tired, you're like, I don't want to watch that. So by the time you t- the little one goes to sl- finally goes to sleep, I'm like, oh, I found something now. I can watch it. And then I forget it by the next time I wake up. Uh, but we get a recap video for the first three matches. Uh, of course, they include Saturday night. Because by, th- by 98, I mean, Saturday night is kind of, a, it might as well not even exist by 98. For the longest time, and we'll, I'm sure we'll discuss it, WCW Saturday night was, I mean, it was the flagship. That's what it was. I mean, that's what you watched WCW. That's what we talked about last week was Turner time, yeah. man. That yeah. 605 to 805 broadcast was the big boy. And by this point in 98, uh, unless it was something special, that Saturday night was a pre-taped. Because yeah. they would tape it on the same nights as Nitro or Thunder, depending on what market they were in. It was done the same way Rampage is with Dynamite most weeks now. Because TK is yeah. using a lot of that same model. Yeah, but I mean, it's this one's match four is a little bit different. It's it's, it's a slower start. It's kind of like they're trying to be like, okay. I mean, you talk about ring psychology. It's 
okay, we both have to start doing something different because they we know we, we've done we've wrestled before this whole best of seven series. We they we've done this three matches so far. Like you can't just do the same game plan. Like you can tell they're trying to figure out different ways to beat it. My my favorite thing about this match is Finley comes out again and you get the audio and he says they know each other but they don't know me and I sure. loved that like he he just talk, he's up there just talking shit and I loved it um this is definitely this we get we still get a showcase with this match of Booker T's aerials we get a showcase of Benoit's ground and pound technical uh you see frustration starting to come into the to the into Booker T because I mean he gets a lot of quick covers just trying to put him away, um, which really plays into that him being behind the series at that point uh, because by that point we're Benoit's up to one, um, but to me has the best finish in the entire series. Booker T, I don't know Jay, I don't know if you have this finish. Benoit counters a vertical suplex into the crossface. Yeah, like just and drives his head down into the mat. Like it's it, it, it it's again like the RKO. It's out of nowhere. Like he's up, he's down, and he's got it. Like Booker's tapping before he even got the crossface on him. What I like about this match was three and four. For anybody who is a pro wrestling or pro sports fan in general, not even wrestling, understands the psychological like struggle it means to go down 3-1 in anything. Yeah. And now Booker, after four matches, is down 3-1. He was the committee's pick. He was supposed to be the chosen one. He's got that rocket ship I mentioned before. And now you look at it, and like I said, I started in match one, and I said throughout the theme, they somehow took the person who was supposed to be the one and made him appear to be an underdog. And I put it on Twitter earlier. I said, this was how a best of seven was supposed to work. And the reason why was because one was timing. They didn't stretch it out for two and a half months. But the other important thing was, whereas everybody expected it to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, to see Chris ripple off a couple wins back to back like this and go up 3-1 kind of gave you that, oh shit, are we going to make it to bash? You know what I mean? Like, is yeah. Chris going to close this out early? Like, yeah. he could win it next week. Yeah. You know, look, at, when you watch them in order and you watch three and then you watch four and then you see Chris rattle off those back to back, you're like, fuck, guys, this might be over now. Yeah. So I liked the way they built the underdog story with Booker because he wasn't supposed to be. He was no, supposed so to already be the guy. Yeah. Yeah. So we get. We get Benoit up now three, three one. The commentators are, I mean, they're really playing it up. Just at this point, Heenan is very much like the Benoit's going to put it away next the next match. Like, been, like it's done. We might as well close the book on it. Um, since we are at that halfway point, hey Jax. Yes. Is it time? Hold on, I need. It's not time yet. Okay. <laughs> I have to fix my camera in a minute. Okay. Well, while he fixes his camera, hey, Jay, hit my intro. <laughs> Get ready because it's Dadhead's dad joke of the week. <laughs> oh, we, we lost Jax. Okay. Oh, there he is. He's being technical. All right. All right. So I was once addicted to the hokey pokey, but I was able to turn myself around. <laughs> <laughs> it took you a second. <laughs> well, I started singing the song in my head. Yeah. All right. One more. We got to the line because it took us about the both the same amount of time because I was like, it is the hokey pokey. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I get it. Lately, people have been making apocalypse jokes like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> that was Dad Hat's Dad Joke of the Week. 
is Jack still laughing? <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing is I need to do more prep work on that and actually pick out which ones. Like, I'm always like, oh, crap, I got to find one that's really good in here. Like, Jax has a style of humor that he's really a fan of. So I feel like we just need to start finding a lot of Jack's appropriate jokes just to see if we can turn him as red in the face as his beard is. Oh, it happens. Oh, it happens. <laughs> these, your eyes just go. Mm-hmm. Like every, every time it happens. Every time it happens. All right. So we are, we're going into match five. Yeah, five at this point. We're back on Thunder, June 4th. This time coming from Piera. I don't know if that's correct. I'm sorry. Peoria. Peoria, sure, sure, Illinois. Um, however, wherever the hell that is in terms of Chicago. <laughs> uh, the only things I know about Illinois is Chicago. And in that where uh, Saturday Night Live, uh, Wayne's, in, Wayne's World, in that where, yeah. in that where Wayne's World is set, is, Illinois, is, is it Illinois? Yeah. Correct. Thank you. That's the only thing I know about. about. <laughs> That's that entire state. Um, Milwaukee. But, so they get what they deserve. And this kind of, this is, you look back on it and now, I mean, it's, it's such a big deal. Like you're talking, even before it was announced for Mania next weekend, people were already talking about like, what should open the show? What match opens the show? Because now it's a precedent because if, if people, and you talk, you listen to legends, you listen to interviews and everything. If you don't want to go on last, you want to open the show. And, for match five, they got to open the show. Uh, we get another video package. I still think it's funny throughout the series that Bobby Heenan cannot say axe kick. Like the entire, he's like, what kick? The ass in the axe kick. Um, <laughs> again, it, it you're definitely seeing that frustration from Booker fighting from behind, coming in. Um this is the first time, though, in the entire series that we see the rolling suplexes, the rolling German suplexes for Benoit, which I always thought, like, it. Two, the two moves, I think, in all of wrestling that made me the happiest is the rolling suplexes, German suplexes, and then the three amigos from Eddie Guerrero. Those two things were my favorite moves in wrestling and kind of still are, the non-finish moves. Uh, just because they were different. But yeah, hell, I can hold on to them and just do a couple more. Um, this is finally the first match where I kind of feel like you see from both All men right. that. What? Wait, what did I miss? I don't know. Jay just put it in the chat. I. Hi. Oh. I don't know. My glasses are on. I can't read the chat, to be completely yeah. honest. Um. <laughs> I'm trying, guys. I'm trying. But you're cool. <laughs> but sorry, stroke. <laughs> we don't need sorry, that stroke. Uh, but this is like the first match. I mean, we're in an episode. Oh, we're episode. I don't know why I keep saying episode. Uh, match five. We see fatigue from both of them. Like it's set in. It's like I got to go do this again. And it's not just fatigue from Booker, who's really fighting from behind now. It's fatigue on Benoit's side of, if I can only put him away, we're done. If I can only put him away, it's done. I, it, it, and it's, 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 each match is different. And, and even though they might do, and I'll get, I've got some notes on this as we get towards the tail end, especially Booker doing a lot of the same moves and moveset where Benoit was really trying to not, do anything similar from match to match it's it's just it's it was refreshing to see a match where they're both just winded and looks they look tired like is this series ever gonna end um one thing i liked about this series guys and i don't know if anybody else noticed it there was very 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 little time spent outside the ring yeah they with the exception of a couple times, they did a good job, and I say this a lot on my show on Sundays, that one of my irks for modern wrestling is breaking the rules. Like One of the whole parts about giving you the realism behind what wrestling is is that they do all of this and set parameters and rules. And you see these guys, especially in the late 90s, especially people like Chris and people like Booker, uh, Stevie Ray eventually when he gets in there, uh, 
like these guys, like especially Harlem Heat, as far as like the tag teams go, they followed the rules. Like yeah. you didn't see them doing a lot of high spots because they wanted to set up and pop. They told stories that made sense in the ring. They allowed each other to get their moves in to get over. They, in this case, they didn't have one night to tell one story. They had what was it? Almost two full weeks between the first match and the last match. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, three weeks, something like that. They did this all throughout <laughs> that period of time. So it was just one match after another. So it was kind of refreshing to see them get gassed, to see three them weeks. get winded. To yeah. make them feel like they were human a little bit, and this was the first time they looked human this whole time was match yeah. five. Yeah, getting that's we're getting closer to that that towards the end, or, or yeah. could, what could be the end. Uh, I mentioned the kind of getting lost in the shuffle because of the whole big storyline with where is Sting going to go? The red and black, the white, the, or the black and the white. It also kind of gets lost in the shuffle because this is the time where even though we're heading towards Great American Bash. The commentary is really starting to set up what's going to happen at Bash at the Beach. And that's going to be DDP and Carl Malone versus the worm Dennis Rodman and Hollywood Hulk Hogan. So, I mean, you've got two big, big storylines going on. That I mean, you, I mean, again, I feel like if you, like, we use the word casual fan a lot right now in professional wrestling. I feel like if you were the casual fan, all you know is kind of what's going on with those big storylines. You're missing this fantastic series. You might hear that they're doing a best of seven, but you have no idea what the score is, who's what, unless you're that like, like for me, like that's probably one reason why I remember this series. and I love this series so much was like, I watched nitro. It was very rare for me, even in 98 to be flipping. Like, uh, I might record raw on a VCR in the living room. But I'm watching, like, and I'm, but I'm watching Nitro, uh, or vice versa. We grew up in two very different tax brackets. If your house had two TVs in 1998, <laughs> um, all I'll say is, if if my mom had to have one thing in the house, it's TVs. <laughs> Keep the, even in even in 98, screen time was still a thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, like I had one in my own room. We, in it's which is weird because we lived in this. I was a uh, raised by my mom, pretty much predominantly just her and everything. <laughs> we lived in this little mill house because all the little mills down here in, in North Carolina that they converted into homes. Uh, but I mean, it was tight, but we had a living room TV. We had a, uh, she had a TV in her room and I had one in mine so I could play video games. Uh, <laughs> maybe not the best TVs in the world, but we had them. But they um, were still there. <laughs> but yeah, so, but I mean, not a lot of times. It, it was more because my mom, she was more WCW. Like, I, I, especially by the time we got to '98 and we're in the heart of the Attitude Era, I knew that I had to make sure she knew nothing that was going on on the other channel because she would not let me ever watch that if she knew what was on there. <laughs> First so, time she caught a glimpse of DX, she'd be like, "Well, this is the end." It of It was that. more Sable. She caught oh. Sable, you know, coming out there. Uh, I think, but here's the thing, though. And I got in trouble with my middle school. This is a little tangent story, but my mom was the office, like office worker in my middle school. So the few times that I told a teacher or a student to suck it, who's the <laughs> first person that I see? It's not a principal, it's mom. So yeah. So it was like I was more scared, I was more scared to walk in the door than go to the principal because I knew who I had to pass. Um, but yeah, so, but I mean, so, but I, she would, she, she likes, re- she liked wrestling. She like, but WCW, because it's who she knew. Like she knew she grew up with the Ric Flair, especially living in the area of Charlotte. Like she knew the Ric Flair. She knew like, she knew, she, knew she liked the wholesome wrestling, the yeah. wrestling. Yeah. That's, and that's how she said it too. Wrestling is wrestling. You're watching wrestling. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean it, it. It and again we get a winner this time with with Booker T going going to what it, it is again his his main finishing move. He's not necessarily deviating from his game plan, and it's missile drop kick for the win. Um, yeah. In today's day and age, I almost feel like it would be okay because. 
again, how I kind of compare the crossface here is to the RKO with, with Randy. Uh, I know Jay is loving this because he. I'm surprised we haven't gotten a, 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 a RK or uh, a uh, Randy Orton picture in here yet because I keep mentioning them mentioning the RKO. <laughs> but uh, he says, Manic says he tells people when he's watching wrestling to shut up because he's watching his stories. <laughs> I've used that phrase a few times about be, about it being my stories. My stories. I've watched my watching stories. My stories. I, tell, I used to tell my grandmother that all the time. Like, I'm watching my stories. Yeah. That is true. That's what wrestling is. It's stories. As it should mm-hmm. be. Days of Our Lives came on. You better bet it was shut up. I'm watching my stories. She wouldn't. My grandmother never actually. My grandmother never said shut up. Like, never really. Never cussed. Very straight laced. Yeah, and it, it, she was like, "Well, you just now need to be quiet because I'm watching my. You just, just hush." Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm yeah. watching the my stories. Like, um, so with match number five, we get a little bit. Match five through the end is where we start to get more of a like. It's been just about the matches. Match five is really where storyline starts to peek its face into into this whole thing. Um, which especially as we get to the one of the last matches we'll talk about, I don't know if that was just a oh crap, we got to figure out a way to do this. Let's just throw this in there, but we'll get there. But like in this case, TV Ray comes out to ringside for the first time, and he just you can't really say he distracts, but Benoit has his attention there, which allows for Booker T to quickly get up top, hit that missile drop kick. So I mean, it's not like CB Ray is you know up on the up on the uh, side of the ring and trying to like you know smack him or do anything like that. He just literally is just talking shit from the ground, and Benoit is just focused on him and loses focus, which is nice. We haven't seen that in a match where you know someone's focus was to something else. So again, layers different, doing things different for the entire series. Um, do you guys think that? Stevie Ray was necessarily needed for this storyline. Yes. It's kind of that slap in the brother's face to be like, dude, get your shit together here. Um, See, I don't. If we're building Booker T as an individual. Stevie Stevie never got involved. Stevie was a moral support when his brother was down and out. Saying, you got this, you can do this, you don't need me, do it, like kind of thing. I mean, I get that, but I, I just, I just looking back on it, I'm just like, this is where you're trying to build him as a single star. S- distance him from the tag team. Distance him from his brother for right now. Which What's I know important is- about. Go ahead. What's important about match five, though, is if you look at the traditional like you know, anatomy of a wrestling match, the match starts match one, you know, it just kind of the first flow, you know, Chris gets the initial advantage. Then the shine starts and you see Booker come back, win in match two. You're like, okay, he's got it. Then Chris starts to get his heat with three and four. And he takes that three to one advantage match five with Stevie Ray coming out and everything that starts to build up to that point is that that stop to it. And he starts his comeback before they build to the finish with the story that happens with match seven. Then what we will get to when we talk about it and how the best of seven ends. Mm-hmm. Like this is the the anatomy of a wrestling match stretched out to three weeks. When you look at how they built each match together in the story they were telling at that point. So this is like the start of Booker's comeback. And Stevie Ray was like the guy that came in. He was the. The guy in Rocky, what's the short little old bald guy's name in Rocky? The, the manager that was like, I got to talk to you, Rock. Like, th- that was his Mickey at the time, you know? Are you throwing a Rocky reference out there just because CM Punk says he's never seen Rocky? Yeah, because CM Punk's <laughs> obviously in our chat right now, and I just wanted to leave him out. It's yeah. a topical joke because yeah. he wouldn't get it because he's yeah. an uncultured swan. <laughs> Sorry. It's you just- know what's funny is I've actually watched a Rocky <laughs> movie <laughs> with him in the room. <laughs> He's never seen it because that's how much he cares. Guys, I have to step away for a second. I will be right back. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't, I mean, I get where both of you guys are coming from, but I just, I don't, I mean, I know I get the, he needs, he's down and he's behind. There needs to be something that motivates him to, to come back, but it's, 
I don't know. I wish it was something else other than Stevie Ray. I wish it was something that was. It, it's just we're trying to build him as a single star. Like, but his brother giving him the rub to be like, you got this. You deserve the spotlight. You deserve to be, you know, the single star that we know you can be. Stevie giving his brother the rub was kind of his way of going. Go do you. We know that yeah. you're supposed to be this guy. You're supposed to be that one. So in a lot of ways, this was Stevie kind of going, don't worry about Harlem Heat. We're still going to be here. This was very much some of the origins that we see a lot of with the New Day because we've seen it when Big E went on his run or when Kofi Mania was happening. They were still the New Day, even though there was obviously a clear-cut number one out of the three. Uh-huh. And I feel like that was kind of the case here. Stevie was going, don't worry about us. We're good. Do you and focus on getting this number one contender spot. Yeah, yeah. And I get it. I mean, I, to- I, I, I totally get it. Um, I just... I want what I want. I want what I want it, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> we are wrestling fans at heart. We're going yeah. to want that instant gratification. And yeah. it was like, man, yeah. just, uh. but I think it was a necessary point when you look at the, the overall story they were telling in all seven matches. Yeah. Which I, I meant to go back and I didn't write this in my notes. I meant to look back and see like how, cause I know by the end of the year, um, I'm guessing the dad had was an only child. no, <laughs> Technically, I did have an older sister, but she was older, and so I mean, I kind of was an only child. But how I much older? A, she's five years. So I mean, okay. we were just always in different parts of life. Like when I was in elementary school, she was in middle school. When I was in middle school, she was high school. When I was high school, she was in college. When I was in college, like, like it just totally, totally not, not getting it. the need for the brother to give his push to his sibling to go out on his own. It wasn't that he needed to give him the push to go out on his own. What he was doing was giving him the reassurance that he understood that at this point it was time for Booker T to shine as a singles competitor. And he was like, you know, helping him. It wasn't a Booker didn't necessarily need that, but being down three, one, then the having the support of his brother coming out, like all of that was the build to start helping with his comeback. That's when Booker T put a stop to it in match five. He started his comeback in match six. Mm-hmm. And Stevie Ray was kind of that catalyst that was part of him starting that comeback. Mm. So then we move on to match six, and we're going back to Nitro. By this point, it's Nitro and Thunder. It's Nitro and Thunder. I mean, the Saturday night thing, I think it was just like I said, literally just used to like make it fit in the time frame they needed to fit. Um, this match starts off a little bit different. This is where they're both like. We talked about the frustration and the tiredness. Oh, he's back. He's back. And uh, Beard says, Will, what you just described by the support is the brotherly push for Booker to do his best. Yes, but also at this point, it wasn't just about brothers. It was about the support, the, the what they had been doing as a tag team. And we talked about it in match one. This was the beginning process of both of these guys becoming single superstars. So it wasn't like... This was more than just brothers. This was also him going, it's okay. Harlem Heat can still be Harlem Heat if Booker T is a successful singles wrestler. But what I was, what I meant to look up, and I totally forgot to, was I meant to look up and see how long, because I know at least by the end of the year, not even, but well, but before the end of the year, by the time we get to War Games, Booker, uh, Stevie Ray is with NWO Hollywood. Like, so I don't know how long after this is the split. So that was one thing that I did not look up that I meant to. But Jay, I'm sure, will have that to me in about two seconds because that's what Jay does. He knows. I'm pretty <laughs> sure the tur- the turn hadn't happened yet. No, 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 not yet. Yeah. Because I love that Stevie Ray was in more games in 98. Like, I was like, yeah, put Stevie Ray in more games. Hell yeah. It makes complete sense. Um, But Jax... We were, we, we were waiting. I was waiting for you before we moved on to match six. So we're back on Nitro, June 8th, 98, Detroit, Michigan. We talked about them being tired in match five. And this match, it starts off a little bit differently. They're pissed at each other. And it's a shoving match at the beginning, which is different. Um, by the point, we're, as the point we got here, what are you seeing when you're watching this now that we're you're, you know, at the start of a sixth out of seven match? 
the same thing I thought after match four. It's do or die for Booker T. Yeah. And it was like it's it's that that winner go home feel of these last matches. Mm-hmm. Just that's what I felt until the final. And we'll get there, and I have my my thoughts on that. Mm-hmm. This is kind of the first time, though, because we were talking about Stevie Ray and the brotherly support. I mean, this is kind of the first time where Stevie Ray gets involved, but not necessarily really involved. He 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 pulls his brother out to like have that pep. August, okay. So a month and a half to two months later is the turn for for yeah. Stevie. So we're still building up to it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Then that makes sense. Okay. Then use of Stevie. Then I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it. Um. That changes my mind. Thank you, Jay. Uh, but we, we, we get that him getting actually physically involved where he pulls out Booker, not necessarily breaking up a, a pin or a submission or anything. It's just to get him and like set him straight. And I think that worked well because it was, look, you don't get your head put on straight. You're done. You're, you're done. Like he, he, he wins. Um, it, this is the this is the match where I started noticing Booker T starting to be a, just a little bit more repetitive with his move sets because it was Alabama Slam, then into into the ropes and does that flapjack where he lifts them up and he pancakes them as they kept saying on commentary and things. So like, and he did that for like three matches straight where Benoit necessarily didn't really do a lot of the same things. Um, this was a, a we got, we, with this match though, we go back to again, a finish that was not with a finishing move. And it was a quick out of the blue, very cool seeing a luchador style Booker T with a, yeah, here we go. A quick roll up the rolling sunset flip. Thank you. Like, just something, again, something different. And it starts, I mean, with both of these, you're showing you're showing that both of these men can, they're going to be able to work with different styles and different people. And in hindsight, they do. They, they both work with people with different sizes, different athletic abilities, like the Ray Mysterios, and, like, Shivani kept calling Spine Busters Sidewalk Slam. Yeah, in every match. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, and I really started noticing that, Jay. Um, Come on, Shivani, you have one job. Don't fuck it up. Well, <laughs> well what's he doing now? Oh, yeah, he's in AW, I think, still. Um, so th- he's just that- catching a check. <laughs> that's exactly that's what, what he's doing. That's all he's doing right now. He's probably like, this is the dumbest shit I've ever seen. Let me just hey, catch my be, check. He could be called baseball. He could he could be doing commentary for baseball. That's what he did. I miss him did. doing my Georgia Bulldogs commentary. I know you do. <laughs> I almost got hit by a, tr- a truck with a Georgia Bulldog tag the other day, and I was just like, "Jack would be like, well, what'd you do to make him run into you?'" Like that's what my thought yeah, was after. Yeah, like, well, don't, don't piss the Bulldog fan off. Um, Go balls. <laughs> Oh, so that, so what, what was that? What was that? What was that? National Football Championships season. two years back to back. Okay. They make up moves in AWs anyway, so no one notices when they mess up. The, yeah. Um, instead of just being the end of a match, this is we get something a little bit different here at the end of this one. This one we get Benoit kind of going after and attacking Booker after the match, and Stevie Ray kind of stepping in to make the save. Like, He's frustrated. He's tired. He wants to end this series, and he just go like, bulldogs going yeah, down. If I go tigers. Correctly, he kicks the leg out from underneath Booker, uh, which then starts to lead into the knee, which is continued all the way through the match with Finley. So they start to they can't they start it's little Easter eggs things here and there. Um, so we get to match seven of seven. <laughs> and we're WCW June eighth, nineteen ninety eight. And before the match, I did not even, see this coming. Before the match, this is where I'm like, did they throw? That they figure out, oh crap, we got to do something, and they just let's just throw this out there. Before the match even starts, you hear NWO music 
not Wolfpack, but NW Hollywood music come out. And Eric Bischoff, along with Canada's favorite son, the best there is, the best there was, the best there ever will be, the best WWF champion that there ever was, the man in black and pink, the the man that literally should be, you know, still wrestling to this day, who should dethrone Roman Reigns, Brett the Hitman Hart comes out onto the stage. Um, whoa, whoa, whoa! Hold on. You think you're gonna skate by the whole the man that should be Roman Reigns today, and not get this person to say anything? Listen, sir. <laughs> I want to see if you caught Bre- that. Bret Hart couldn't beat Roman Reigns on Roman Reigns' worst day. The only man that could ever beat Roman Reigns is Cody Rhodes. I don't care for Bret Hart outside of the ring, but I am a huge in-ring Bret Hart fan. He's cheater! <laughs> like, the most technical yet the most snooze-inducing worker ever, Bret Hart. I love Bret Hart. I always have. Always He's on my uh, Mount Rushmore. I love Bret Hart. Not for outside the ring. No. I, I attempted to read his, you know, War and Peace. Thank you, Super book. Beard. No, I, I mean Owen is Owen is better. I will agree with that. I will agree with that. But just to get that made of it push that he should have. But because anyway, yeah. yeah. So we're we're back we're back in match seven, and so Eric Bischoff and Bret Hart come out, and they offer membership to NW Hollywood to Chris Benoit. They have a shirt ready for him, and Hart really lays into the. You, this is where you belong because you need to I, – I remember who started your career, who got you into this business, who got you trained with my brothers and my father in the heart dungeon. Like he's laying it on thick. And then they literally go and sit on the hood of a car that just happens to be sitting by the entrance ramp. Like – which I feel like if I remember correctly happened a lot um, with Bret Hart and Eric Bischoff. They would just be sitting in a, back on a car somewhere. Multiple episodes, uh, and he was always wearing a Hogan, that Hogan shirt, which I always thought was funny, um, especially looking at it later in life. But the funny thing is, Ben Watt comes out, looks at him, and smiles. And I remember that happening and being like, ooh, let it happen. Let it happen. Uh, <laughs> Let's go for it. Yeah, but you get Stevie Ray, Stevie Ray coming out with Booker T, but Booker T does what the underdog baby face is supposed to do. He sends him away. He sends his brother away and tells him that he will do it by himself. Um, again, very aggressive from Benoit at the start. Benoit throughout this match, he's working on the knees. He's working on the legs. He's trying to take down the big offensive moves, the the axe kick, the the missile drop kick, the Harlem hangover, the uh, Harlem sidekick, all of the big moves that Booker T uses. Um, throughout the match, we get camera shots of Bret Hart and Bischoff at the car watching and talking. Um, we get some quick finishes like Booker T with an attempted backslide for the win. Um, an amazing submission move from Benoit, that bridged submission. Like arching, like he's completely bridged, arching uh, Booker T's neck. He's got his feet tied up, uh, which was a very cool move. Of, this was this was like the first match in the series, though, where like commercials cut in, and I'm like, yeah. you're cutting in commercials at the tail end, which technically this is supposed to be the last match of the series, but this is when you're cutting into commercial. Like, it, I'm again, one hand is not talking to the other. WCW. Um, again, we talk about storyline starting to play a part here, and Bret Hart comes down, hits Booker T in the back, in the back of the head with a chair. Benoit sees it, and then tells the ref, who then throws out the match and disqualifies, makes Booker T the winner. Does this feel just like shit thrown against the wall? You two, this NWO, Bret Hart, like all that. Like, what are your thoughts on this random storyline? Because we had the storyline going on with Stevie Ray and Booker. This, this just came out of nowhere at the very last match. 
when you look at what happens later with Stevie Ray eventually joining the NWO and them trying to recruit Benoit, it goes back to what I was saying also about how at this point in 98, WCW and NWO were almost working as two independent brands in a lot of ways. Um, with, without ever having that official brand split, not that brand splits exist in wrestling anyways. They say they do, but they don't. Um, at this point, though, you saw a lot of the NWO trying to recruit everybody, trying to get them in. And uh, this was that kind of that twist. It was that little bit of a, a plug in the story to help elevate this story more by incorporating the NWO into it. Because once again, we talked about the difference between Nitro and Thunder with the theatrics versus the wrestling. This was a chance to kind of bridge the two and put them together by incorporating the NWO, which was the predominant story on their television, into what they were building into the pay-per-view. Because everything happened building into Great American Bash. Jax, what about you? This, this random Bret Hart NWO thing that affects the entire series of the mat of the uh, the entire series as a whole. Did they go? I didn't. I didn't watch past it. Did they go anywhere after that with? Yeah, Chris and Brett. Yeah. Well, uh, or that kind of like, no, I think Chris leaves. Chris leaves, but we get so later. Just in, like a useless yeah, thing, kind of. And then, but we get later in the show. JJ Dillon is interviewed by Tony Schiavone. He calls out Booker T. Stevie Ray comes with him. Booker T. says that he's the best he's ever been in the ring with him in his short little career that he's had so far. Uh, but he wants one more match to correct this. Um, and of course, Stevie Ray is like, "Take the win." Take the like you you're one you're the champion you take the win but that's not what the baby face does, uh, and then JJ Dillon confirms that they will do one more match, Chris Benoit and Booker T at the Great American Bash that Sunday. The winner will then wrestle a second match that night against Fit Finley for the championship. Um, so really, we're going best of eight here, guys. Um, and this is this is Great American Bash 1998. Um, it's a big card. It's a big card overall with this 1998 Great American Bash. You get brand new Wolfpack Sting versus the Giant main eventing for the tag team titles because they were tag team partners at one time. You get Conan versus Goldberg for the U.S. title, and then Kurt Henning turns on Conan and jumps from red and black NWO to white and black NWO. Um, it's, it, you get one of the classic trios, mat, like trios in this, from the series of Macho Man, Randy Savage, and Diamond Dallas Page. Uh, it's a big pay-per-view. It's one of my favorites from 1998 from WCW um, is this one. But we do get it. We go to Baltimore, Maryland. Um, they get, again, they get the opening match. They get the opening match. And I will say of every match in this series, I don't know if it's because it is a pay-per-view. I don't know if it's the city. But this was the most the crowd was into the, one of these matches across the board. Could you guys tell that too? It was hot, but it was also a pay-per-view crowd. I feel like since I watched it on Peacock, there was noise piped into it anyway. But I was, I thought that too, but I was watching. But you like could, that. no, you could watch the crowd reaction. I felt like, yes, yeah, a great American bash. I don't know if it's because it was a pay per view where, like you said, where it was located, but yeah, the crowd did feel more pumped into it. Matt Ward, yes. I, I and I remember that Chris and Chris Benoit and Bret Hart having a that match to pay to pay homage to Owen. Like, this was I, also less than a year after Survivor Series 97 and Screwjob. So this was all during the the you know the shit show that was how Brett was handled with his arrival in WCW. All of these mishandled, you yeah. know, like you said, throwing shit at the wall and seeing what sticks. This was a lot what was happening with his booking when he first got over to the new company. Yeah, yeah. You know, well, I'm sure we'll do a Bret Hart episode at some point, but like, yeah, he. I mean, he came in so late, like so, like so long after the Scrooge. Like it should have been literally the next night. 
This is the part of the onion we were talking about in the first episode, how one episode could give us 12 episodes of content because we could do an hour just on Brett's arrival in WCW. Yeah, we could. Yeah, we could. Um, Throughout the match at Great American Bash, you get Booker T favoring that knee. You get Benoit working on it. Um, It's a very dominant Benoit match throughout the the Great American Bash match. Um, There is a sick sick kick to Benoit's, the back of Benoit's head. And I remember seeing that and just being like, oh, that hurt. That just hurt to watch. Um, But like the underdog, which who, I mean, but sorry, there were no real big face heel in this, but Booker T was definitely the face if you had to separate the two. And coming back from behind, an underdog story, Booker T will win this match and go on later that night to to to, to wrestle Fit Finley. Uh, there it is. Yeah. Like the height he gets with that, those kicks, it's just amazing to me. Um, Jax, thoughts on the final match and the and being at the Great American Bash and which is a, is a was a big pay per view for WCW. I went into this whole thing forgetting like not remembering the feud, mm-hmm. so kind of got like a felt like fresh watching it. So when it came to this last match, man, I was cheering for Booker T, but I also thought it was bullshit. He won by disqualification. He should have took the win. I don't care what a baby face does. A win's a win. win. Listen to your brother. Listen to your brother, sucker. Uh, uh, Vince, we need a Jack's Bow sucker shirt. I'm just saying. (laughs) I don't know what we can incorporate on it, but something with sucker. Um, What about you, Will? Last match of the series, Great American Bash. Hot crowd, seems like. I feel like they consistently allowed each person to win with the same kind. You, you saw Booker get three of his wins with the missile drop kick. You saw Chris get two of his wins with crossface. Like when you look at how they won their matches, um, it was it was a good way. I've, I've used this analogy before. When you go see a band like Metallica Life, you're going to get a phenomenal show. But if you see the same show on that tour, you're going to get the same show back to back. Okay. If you go see a band like fish, you're not going to get the same show every night they're on tour. You're going to get, you know, different sets and different, you know, fills to the vibe and everything they do. These guys did a great job of doing that. They kept a lot of, they played their hits, but they didn't necessarily, you didn't get inter Sandman one. And for whom the bell tolls every night, because you knew that's what they were going to do. You know what I mean? They like, hit their hits, but they also made sure that they didn't like, you know, they kept shine a spotlight on it every single time. Exactly. And I feel like that's one of the biggest takeaways here. It wasn't that it was seven matches. It was that it was seven uniquely different matches that kind of all felt the same. If that makes any sense at all for me to say it that way, because they were seven very, or technically eight very unique matches, but they all had that same kind of, Phil Booker was winning a lot the same way. Chris was winning a lot the same way. And the fact that the missile drop kick kind of came out of nowhere two of the three times, and then the crossface came out of nowhere two of those three times, it kind of felt like you didn't know where that ball was going to bounce. And that yeah. was good. That was good storytelling for what they were doing. Yeah. Um, did you both watch the Finley match with Booker T? I rewatched most of it, and then, and by that I mean I, I, I fast it. forward through like two thirds of it till I got to about the finish, yeah. the last yeah. couple minutes of it. I, I, I watched mean, it. Right. That's how I watched it. Yeah, it, it. I mean, it's it's definitely a different match after watching all these. Like, it really is just Finley coming in and attacking that knee and attacking that knee just over and over, working that against the ring post, all the stuff that you you. It's a much slower match compared to the Benoit matches. Um, shows how adaptive like we talked about it. How Booker T can adapt to work with other, other styles and other types of of, of wrestlers. Um, but we get a brand new champion. Booker T wins the best of seven series, technically eight, and then defeats mm-hmm. Fit Finley with a without his missile drop kick, doing a pile driver. 
I miss the pile driver. I miss it's my it favorite being, finish of all time. Yeah, I miss the pile driver. Um, I get why it's not because I mean, you could do some serious damage, but um, I miss the pile driver. But I asked both of you, what's your favorite match of the eight? Damn. Probably the match at Bash, not because it was the best match, but I felt like given everything that happened the night before, not technically the night before, but you see what like given what happened with yeah. Brett and everything that happened in the first game seven and then turn around. Um, and I have taken a pile driver uh, before, you know, game seven turned around. Uh, you don't have like that push that you know do or die one and only this is it like that was the that that moment and i feel like you could see it in both their work they both of them at different points had moments when they were gassed and both of them at different points had moments where they were making comebacks so to speak and like i said the anatomy of this best of seven was built just like the anatomy of a wrestling match and you saw that at different points and i i, I liked that about it but i think match one and match seven were kind of my bookend favorites for the yeah, series for that I reason agree. Uh, I will throw in match four just for that awesome cross face finish from the vertical suplex. Just for that. What about you, Jax? Favorite of the seven, eight. I would have to say the eighth. The bash. Being that one last one, Booker T thought he had it. He was set. He was ready to go. Then he's got to go do it one more time. Yeah. One more rodeo. And. I listened to Booker T's uh, interview he did on the Jericho cruise mm -hmm. where they did that. He's, and he said, he goes, those are my favorite. I got to do eight of them. Yeah. And he's always talked very fondly of that series, but like, I just think that that eighth match right there, knowing he has to do it one more time. Mr. B roll. Welcome to B roll. What's yeah. going on, buddy? B roll who designed our lovely world championship wreckage logo. My man. Um, yeah, it's a great series. It's fantastic. I, again, anybody who has, has not watched this B roll. I know you being the wrestling newbie, I want to send you the dates for these. So you can watch all of them because this is where it's, it's a great series to watch. Um, so a couple different things. We all, one thing I always said I wanted to do in terms of the show is with every topic, we talk about the good and the bad of each thing. For you guys, what's the good that we take away from this best of seven? There's got to be something bad for this best of seven. What yeah, is Bret Hart getting involved is the bad thing. It made no damn sense. Okay, that's what Jack says. You're, you're good. What's your good? That we got eight good matches. That's the, the, my good is we got we got the series, and then for people who didn't get to experience the series originally, got a version of it later on down the line in WWE. Yeah, I don't know if I've ever seen the WC uh, the WWE best of seven. That one was for the U.S. heavyweight title. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if I ever saw that. I think it was only a best of five. I might need to go back <laughs> and watch that. Well. You're good. Um, you're bad. My good is, uh, I, I want to say the technical proficiency, um, but that might not be the word for it because the chat made it perfectly clear that technical wrestler means boring wrestler. So that might not be the right thing because these matches weren't boring, but the stories they told from beginning to end made this an interesting story for three weeks because yeah. we had the three weeks that the matches happened leading up to the pay-per-view and the week prior to it. So we literally got eight matches and a week of, you know, building up into it pretty much. So we got all of this in like an expedited, just pounded through fashion. And I feel like we were able to get so much story in such a short amount of time and they executed it so well. That was the good. Uh, the bad was towards the end. It felt kind of spotty throwing in the interferences and all of that. That was definitely didn't seem like the story. It, the program didn't need that. It didn't need Brett. It didn't need the tie-in with the NWO. If you wanted Benoit to be tied into the NWO later, 
then you should have had that interaction with Chris happen after this series was done. I'm looking at where my comments are, and I just see a floating thing going around my I, head. I have a question that I wrote down. Yeah, yeah, man. Hold on, I'm trying to get to it. I have notes. In y'all's opinion, do you think the best of seven series is what made Booker T into a singles competitor? They like said, "Hey, this guy can do it." Yeah, I agree with that. I, I had a very, I had a very similar question. Was if this best of seven match doesn't happen, does Booker T? I'll even throw Benoit up there. Do, do they get elevated to that next level? Do they? Are they as big of a deal going into WWE when the when they finally arrive there, like without the series. No, because the three years leading up to the transition after this point, it was where they both, you know, catapulted. Yeah. They both, you know, this was the, the jumping off point for both of them in 98. So if you look at where they were at come 2001, after the buyout happened, I feel like the three year build to this, this was that catalyst for both of them because neither one of them had been main event features as singles competitors in WCW at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, so we always want to kind of let you guys know what won the poll for this week as we head towards the wrapping up this episode of world championship wreckage. So we're going to have to wait this one time on what the winner is because it's okay. I understand. I understand y'all. It's so exciting. to want to talk about the dungeon. I understand. We have to wait. It, it, you know, we, we might we have, have ourselves. we might be having a special guest join us for what the winner is was but we have to make sure it worked out with his schedule i want to get the the yes you know yes yes yes, yes. i want to get it, the yes before uh yes. we make the official announcement and if he can't do it the next show then we will do a, the runner up and then do that one when he was available uh so be on the lookout for our social medias uh world championship wreckage is on Twitter at WC Wreckage Pod, I believe. Uh, I'm the one that made the damn thing. I should know what the what the uh, <laughs> what the tagline is. Please hold. Yes, at WC Wreckage Pod. Uh, also, we have our own TikTok. There is also uh, I am planning on making one for Clapper because I am now on that as well, and it's getting. I'm getting quite a bit of views from there. But next week, we will not have an episode of World Championship Wreckage because next week is the granddaddy of them all, the showcase of the immortals, WrestleMania. But tune in here to TGN. Um, there's going to be stuff a little uh, kind of like how Jax and Vince and everybody here did the oh, stuff on. Yeah, we're going to be doing a, um, what's called a, a WrestleMania thon. WrestleMania where, thon. Where we're going to start with Stand and Deliver and end after night two of WrestleMania with a whole bunch of activities in between. Oh, I thought you were going to go to the end of Raw. Yeah, we thought about that too. Then we decided to get that. Yeah, uh, get some sleep before Raw. Uh, but I always want to plug everybody. And everything. Well, what does Rivet City Radio got going on over the next week and for anything for Mania? We have a stacked week at Rivet City Radio. We've got Dirty Belly coming back tomorrow morning. The The chefs will be breaking down the history of collard greens and how they've been used in Southern cuisine over the last few decades. Uh, tomorrow night, we have Georgia independent wrestling superstar Hold My Beer Hansen. Tuesday, we've got the silverback uh, Nate Slater. We've got mm -hmm. the Savage Gentleman, uh, Victor Benjamin, this week. We've got Trivia on Thursday. And then we are doing our night one uh, live reactions on Sunday before night two. We are doing our WrestleMania predictions on Botch Bots and Share Shots tomorrow night. So starting tomorrow, we've got Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday, Sunday on rivet city radio we've got tons streaming i have a subathon coming up 
to uh, to help get some subs in to fund a trip to uh, a show coming up. We're trying to get up to Chicago to see some uh, Warriors of Wrestling. So we're going to do a subathon, a la Geeks and Noobs, to, to help fund that trip and get us up to Chicago for a, a really cool opportunity. But tons of stuff coming down the pipes for you guys to look out for over on Rivet City. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And here on TGN, of course, you've got on Wednesdays, you have got the Russell Talk Wolfpack. You can see my ugly mug. Jax's beautiful reddish beard every week, along with Self Bet and Bree and Super Beard. Uh, we've got Wrestling with Toxicity on Tuesday, uh, Punk Driver on Monday, uh, about to say Friday Night Fight Night on Friday. I'm about to say, I literally just said Friday. It's in the name. <laughs> <laughs> Friday Night Fight Night on Sundays. Yeah. Um, <laughs> on Thursday, uh, you got the Geeks and News podcast where who knows what. What Jax and Superbeard will be talking about. They've been covering musicals, what got snubbed at the Oscars, all different types of stuff. Um, and like I said, next week for Mania, sub a little subathon here. People drop it in. I'm going to do my best in between, you know, trying to watch Mania, but also let my kid, my four year old, watch Mania for the first time and maybe jump in the stream at the same time, but also not keep him up super late. So that's what we've got going on. So, no show next week, but we're still going to do a poll. So, since Jax went first last time, I'll go first with what mine is. Actually, I'll let Will go first, because last week I said mine, and I got a, you son of a bitch. <laughs> uh, mine, I'm going to uh, I'm gonna put it out here, and this is such a polarizing piece of wrestling history. Um I'm going to do the Hogan Hill turn bash at the beach, 1996. Okay. Like Good one. I feel like that's such a crucial point of history. Uh, I wanted to talk about the history and the origins of WCW. And I feel like if you go in, you know, like order, I think if you start with the start, the next biggest thing, in my opinion, like, Hey, thanks for the follow on my end. Um, but the, the important thing is like everything that went into it. So uh, yeah. I'm I'm excited. Sweet. All right, I'll go next so Jax can go last. Uh, I think Jax is going to be also trying to figure out who we're going to raid after this. Um, oh, yeah, that's what I should be doing. But mine, and y'all will know, you two will know this, why it means something so special to me. Um, but my choice, and if we don't do it this next week it will this topic will come back we i will throw this out there until we do it uh i want to cover the life and the career of one of the most i think underrated wrestlers to ever step in the ring i want to talk about the life and the career of chris canyon oh that's a great one. Oh, that's a good watch i want to talk about chris Ooh, canyon i yeah. want to talk i want to talk about everything with him uh it, I'm down with I'm down with rating rating him. Jax. Don't say it. I want everyone not, to be surprised. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I feel like yeah, yeah, yeah. We should, yeah. Um, but yeah, mine's gonna be the the life and the career of Chris Canyon for my pick. Jax. The WCW Hardcore Title. Oh, oh we're going into the too. Russo era. I had to rip the bandaid off something. I feel like we need like a sound clip of something anytime like something is pitched from the Russo era. Like like oh, something shit. Like, I have a clip. I'm gonna send it to Jay. It's a shit. it's a clip of Russo making fun of Cornet, <laughs> making fun of Russo, if that makes any sense at all. Yes. Yeah, real quick, I do want to say everyone, please stick around for this raid tonight. This is gonna be a nice one. I have this is gonna be a cool one of my personal favorite people like, ever are we been right we've been trying to raid some cool people lately yeah. like t-pain so t-pain lebna motherfucking lebna <laughs> so stick around fuck <laughs> fuck uh as always i am your friendly neighborhood dad hat wearing wrestle talk creator uh joined by me this week and every week the Will Gray from Box Spots and Chair Shots and Rivet City Radio, and a dude that I could not go a, a day without talking to, my buddy, the Ginger Ninja Jacksbo. 
Jax, Debbie. I love you, brother. Will, I love you, man. Thank you guys again. I will thank you probably at the end of every Stick episode. Stick around for the raid, please. Let's, Let's go raid, raid this motherfucking genius. Please. Yeah, baby, I got one more thing to say. Your gas tank is full. Your dipstick is in. Your windows wash. Y'all come back and see me again. <laughs>